Staying with the peas today, um, preeclampsia, pulmonary embolus, and then pulmonary hypertension next. And then if you have to go pee after that, um, we'll have a small break in which you can do that. But I was talking to one of the registrants at lunch who happened to tell me that her, one of her favorite destinations is Costa Rica. And this presentation will feature a lot of information about pulmonary embolism but it'll also feature some of the birds that are present in Costa Rica. And I have to thank one of my friends, William Smith, Bill Smith, for his photographic abilities, because he's the one that captured all of these fine specimens that will be seen. And this is a brown hooded parrot, and um, is a nice introductory point to this idea of your night on call. And when we are on call, we are faced with a lot of different types of patients, and certainly the patient who complains of a lot of dyspnea, has some right shoulder pain, um, is really huffing and puffing, and you're thinking to yourself, and this is incidentally a tricolor heron, and we have three questions that we think about. One, why me? <laughs> I'm a white cloud. This shouldn't be happening on my call. Um, secondarily, how is the patient doing? And finally, could this be a PE? And when we go through that differential in our mind and how we should react to it, um, what our thoughts should be and who to contact, I thought a thoughtful way to look at this would be to just underscore the basic facts of pulmonary hypertension. Look at the instigators of what causes this um, pulmonary embolus to occur. The responses that we should invoke, uh, both acutely as well as chronically, to sort of diagnose whether or not this is a pulmonary embolus. And finally, some of the defenses, spells out bird if you wonder where we are. And incidentally, this is a red-legged honey creeper, um, really gorgeous bird. This is a saber-winged violet hummingbird. Um, and it's a perfect way to introduce the basic facts. And the basic facts of uh, pulmonary embolus is that when we have the entity of pregnancy, we recognize that people are more at risk of venous thromboembolism, which is composed of deep venous thrombus as well as pulmonary emboli. It is the sixth leading cause of obstetric-related deaths following behind cardiac causes as well as hemorrhage, but it's something that we need to be familiar with. And the eighth leading cause, if you follow down to that pike, is amniotic fluid embolism. And when we think about amniotic or air embolism, we sometimes wonder whether or not that's part of our differential and whether we should consider that path or whether should we should go down the pulmonary embolus path. And, and we'll find a way to look at that comparison as we go further along. But we understand that pregnancy comes with it a lot of risk in part because of the changes in the coagulation parameters. And as you get further along in the course of pregnancy, the risk of a DVT and subsequently a pulmonary embolus increase. And this risk is even further magnified in the postpartum period, where you have a 60 times increased incidence. Pulmonary embolus is essentially what is happening to the right heart and the capacity of the right heart to engineer the pressures necessary in order to create forward flow of blood. The right wall of the ventricle is not very thick. It has a limited capacity to generate pressure, generally about 40 millimeters of mercury, after which it starts a failure mode sort of operation. When the right ventricle is under stress, uh, it's thin walled, it balloons out, it tends to capture um, some of that fluid. You start having tricuspid regurg, starts bowing over the septum into the left side. Uh, left side can't fill as actively, and so you have cardiovascular collapse that can sometimes occur. You definitely have ischemia that can also occur um, to the heart, both the right and left hand sides. And this, if ongoing, can be a critical problem, as we all recognize. What it is mitigated on is whether or not this emboli is large, whether or not it's in a primary location with a satellite embolus, whether there's concurrent disease that have already impacted the heart and the lung, whether there is ability to light that clot and the ability to get to that clot, and finally, if there's an ongoing source of this emboli. So when we are faced with a pulmonary embolus, or at least the thought of a pulmonary embolus, we start going through our differential and we ask ourselves, gosh, what are the classic signs of a pulmonary embolus? Can I define that this is what is going on versus the amniotic fluid 
and bliss or air and bliss or, or maybe something else like an asthma attack or maybe it's something blocked in, in my you know, endotracheal tube or something. So we understand when we look at evidence that comes out of big pulmonary embolus registries as well as what happens in the emergency room that there are some symptoms that are common when you have a pulmonary embolus. So you have dyspnea, the chest pain, the cough, substernal chest pain, all these things that we classically look for, including the leg pain. And so when we look at this list, we go, gosh, all right, I have many things on this list. It must mean that I have a pulmonary embolus. But what's kind of confusing, and certainly diagnostically makes it very complicated, is when there is no pulmonary embolus, it gives almost the exact same sort of symptoms and signs. Um, and so that presents us with a lot of confusion. And so when we take a look at these and we look at the entities of pregnancy, post-pregnancy, and even before pregnancy if you're taking birth control, and this was a nice registry that's uh, housed out of Spain. It's a multi-European uh, registry of thromboembolic phenomenon. They looked at specific symptoms of what happens in pregnancy and postpartum pregnancy, and I've highlighted in red what is the most frequently uh, observed sort of symptom. And so you see the same sort of litany of, of different symptoms, but sometimes they aren't very sensitive or specific, as we defined out earlier. So we need to turn to other signs. And unfortunately, when you look at heart rate or when you look at changes in blood pressure, these are not very specific signs for a pulmonary embolus or not having a pulmonary embolus. So we dig a little bit further, and one of the things that we can take a look at is the EKG, and what the EKG might be telling us in terms of what the heart is seeing, in terms of uh, whether it's now pushing against increased pressure load, especially on the right heart. Unfortunately, 60% of all those EKGs, even in the diagnosis confirmed cases of pulmonary embolus, absolutely normal. Where we can focus a little bit of effort is on what's happening with repolarization, but also in instigation of the EKG pattern, or at least what is happening in the ventricle. What we oftentimes see is a negative T wave indicating that the right ventricle is now offering some strain or is having difficulty pressing that blood through the lungs. We sometimes see this S1, Q3, T3 pattern. I'll, I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. But also you can have the advent of a right bundle branch block. The right bundle branch block is because the right heart is now pushing, it's fully dilated, it's now pushing against the pressure of the blocked pulmonary vessels. And so it's indicating to you that it's a little bit more of a strain. The right ventricle is now dilated. It, it transfers that electrical energy just a little bit slower. So you have what's called an R, R prime sort of situation. You have a widening of the QRS complex because the two ventricles are not allowing electrical energy to pass through them both at the same time. Looking at what the SQT um, waves are looking at, the S1 indicates that there is a little bit of a delay in the instigation of that electrical signal. Um, that's why you have the S wave and lead one. The Q wave oftentimes indicates that you're now seeing a little bit of ischemia in the right side of the heart, the right ventricle. And the T wave inversion cer certainly is that repolarization change is going to be slightly delayed and altered because the right ventricle is now very dilated. So the S1, Q1, Q3, T3 is something we, we can feature. The other thing we oftentimes think about is what's going on with the oxygen saturation. And our, our always first thought is that the saturation is going to decrease. But there, in fact, what was demonstrated in this large registry, once again, is by and large people, pregnant women, who have, or even women who are non-pregnant who are taking birth control pills, don't exhibit large decreases in their saturation. We also can send off blood gases, take a look at these, but by and large, uh, these are normal pregnancy values. And so that's not gonna help us out very much as well. So we're in a quagmire here, right? And we need to think about what are possibly the risk factors that are causing this pulmonary embolus that might give me some additional information as to the diagnosis. And when we think about 
these sort of risk factors, I divide them into changes in transit, changes in thrombosis, and then finally the presence of trauma. Uh, Virchow's triad is what classifies these three entities. It's interesting that in 1856, when Virchow described what were the risk factors for pulmonary embolus, and he was doing it based on autopsy findings, was he actually proposed two things. So it was a Virchow's dyad, um, the venostasis and the hypercoagulability. In fact, he had notable, very public discourses with French physicians that trauma was not a part of this situation. Only about 50 years after his death, um, those debates formulated this idea that trauma was one of the things that was uh, important to this entity. And he gets the credit even though he didn't believe it. Um, but we now think of Virchow's triad. And what we see in pregnancy is expressions of this complete triad. When we look at venous stasis, we understand that the venous system is compressed by the gravid and growing uterus, places some pressure on the IVC and blood return to the heart. We also rec recognize that the coagulation system is, is ramped up over the course of pregnancy, mostly due to estrogen, and I'll show you an example of that. And finally, with the trauma elements, certainly placental separation can invoke a lot of tissue factors that allow coagulation to be expressed. And that's why we oftentimes see it in the postpartum period. In pregnancy, we oftentimes use left uterine displacement. We're militant about this sometimes. And in fact, we're the first to sometimes recognize that we need to displace the uterus. Um, generally, after the 20th week, we understand that the uterus is now emerging out of the pelvis into the abdominal contents, puts pressure on the IVC. And this interesting study that was done at Tokyo Women's Hospital, um, Iguchi demonstrated with MRI evidence at two separate levels, the lumbar 2-3 and lumbar 4-5, what happens when you introduce displacement. And you can see in panel A and E, there's a very thin margin of the IVC, the inferior vena cava. It's, it's totally compressed. And even when you get to 15 degrees or 30 degrees, you start opening it up. It's not really till you get to 45 degrees that you have full sort of expressive capabilities through that. And so you can understand that perhaps a woman just laying in the bed, recumbent position, maybe flat, will diminish blood flow through the venous system. Um, interestingly, what they also demonstrate was that the aorta was not compromised at all. Um, and this will have some relevance in a later picture that I'll talk to you about. But um, so this idea of aortal cable compression is probably not correct. It's probably just cable compression that we witness uh, when we have a gravid uterus and we have a woman who's laying in a recumbent position. But where that aorta being fully dilated comes into effect is what happens to the venous compression that falls below the aorta, and specifically iliacs. And it's kind of interesting, um, your left leg is more commonly the holder of that DVT. And this works out great because when I'm going in and I'm called to see a patient, um, without even looking at which leg is affected, I'll walk in and I'll say, how long has your left leg been bothering you? And they go, oh, man, this guy's a genius. <laughs> So it's a great way to sort of create that patient rapport that you want, right? Um, but why that occurs is the right, um, so the, the aorta is fully filled up, the right iliac and right femoral vessels cross over the right venous system, and in doing so, it causes compression of the left lower limb. And that's why you oftentimes get this femoral vein and iliac vein in pregnancy having that thrombus formation. In fact, when you're non-pregnant, it's generally not the iliac and femoral. It's the distal veins that gets the thrombus, and that's what sends up to your heart. Um, but in pregnancy, it's actually the iliac or the femoral. It's higher up, in part because it can press the force that the uterus, as well as the aorta, provides to that system. Okay. So something to think about here. In terms of why pregnancy increases coagulation, it's the estrogen component. We've created some different models. We've looked at this very carefully. Um, estrogen drives a coagulation profile, and it also drives a decreased fibrinolysis that you see 
in pregnancy. So this double whammy is why you have a ramped up system that can cause trouble, especially intrapartum, but also postpartum as well. And finally, when it comes to tissue trauma, this nice study from Marcel Levy's group um, in the Netherlands indicates that when you have pregnancy and you have delivery associated with that, it's actually the vaginal delivery that causes release of more tissue thrombin or tissue factors. Um, so what you see before you are three time frames. Before is before delivery, after is one hour after delivery, and day is 24 hours after delivery. And it's interesting, when you look at the white bars, which is a vaginal delivery, you actually get more release of cl tissue clotting factors than you do after a cesarean delivery. Um, but cesarean delivery naturally sometimes causes immobilization of patients, and with that immobilization plus the tissue factors, you get increased clotting ability. So here's where we get to play a little game, and the game is called Risk Roulette. You have in front of you columns of different risks for pulmonary emboli. And when you look at these lists, I want you to think when you're comparing one column to the other, so the first column, the one on your left to the one on the right, which entity you would rather have? <laughs> if I were to say you have to pick one, and you know, we'll see what your risk factors look like and how that translates off to pulmonary embolus, um, I want you to look at this and, and kind of make your decisions, picking back and forth. And then I'll highlight the, the features that really put you at significantly increased risk of pulmonary blood. Okay? So we look at transit time, we look at thrombosis, we look at trauma. All these elements are important for that birth child's triad. Well, now that you've made your decisions, okay, um, the first column, the, the column to your left, are major factors. Those are factors that if you have just a single one of them, you're at significantly greater risk of pulmonary emboli. And if you have many of them, that really magnifies that risk. Okay? Whereas the right-hand column, those are minor factors. You generally have to have two or more of them in order to increase your risk appreciably. Okay? But it's kind of funny because sometimes you look at and you hear about protein S, protein C deficiency, and you're like, ah, that's really bad. <laughs> you know? But in actuality, when you compare it to the other entities, factor V Leiden, which is so common, 5% of the population has that. Um, you want to take these risks and measures together, put it into a formula that uh, makes you think about the likelihood of pulmonary emboli. So once we are perceiving that we probably are dealing with a pulmonary embolus. What should be our response to this? I mean, we can put our heads into water, uh, ask one of our colleagues to handle it, you know, suddenly go off call or something, or we can really face this um, straightforward. And in terms of looking at how we should achieve this, we need to think about those differentials. Um, pulmonary embolus is a common entity, but so is many other entities that we see in pregnancy. Some of the rarer things are certainly amniotic fluid embolism, but some of the entities that I think are the most likely would be things related to reactive airway disease, certainly in the lung, but on the cardiac side, we think about preeclampsia, maybe some of the tocolysis that's being involved in peripartum cardiomyopathy. And looking at this whole constellation and thinking about how to put it together, I think there's the presence of teasers that make it more difficult. And these teasers are the fact that pregnancy, you oftentimes hit many of these parameters, like heart rate of greater than 100, that make you think about a pulmonary embolus, but that's just part of pregnancy. Also, we have a weakness in terms of there's no reliable test that takes a look at all the criteria and figures out a calculus of how risky it is for someone to have a pulmonary embolus like we do in non-pregnant situations, and I'll show you those, those criteria. And finally, the thread is that we don't have sometimes the best therapies available, and sometimes we're still working on the best amount of therapeutic interventions for people who are pregnant. But in the non-pregnant situation, for example, we have the simplified wells, but also the Geneva criteria by which we can apply these templates to what we're seeing physiologically, and we can decide whether or not someone's at high risk of pulmonary embolus. But in pregnancy, these criteria don't work, in part because heart rate greater than 100, that sometimes 
normal pregnancy will give you a heart rate greater than 100. Moreover, if they've just had a cesarean delivery, that means it just had surgery, that gives you two points with the wells, that means it's a PE, but it could just be normal pregnancy, right? So that makes it very difficult. Instead, we still, and we do have an algorithm. This algorithm has been approved by American Thoracic Society, it's also been approved by American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and basically they say if you suspect that there is a pulmonary embolus, ask the patient or query if they have leg symptoms. If they do, do a compressive ultrasound. If it's present, then just start treatment for pulmonary embolus. If it's not, you have another sort of algorithm that you can follow that includes doing a chest x-ray, which is interesting because they used to just send people immediately to CT angiogram or VQ scan, but the chest x-ray will sometimes give you a diagnostic entity one way or the other. But we do oftentimes use the angiogram, and then based on that, we decide whether or not to treat or not. But oftentimes, what we see as anesthesia providers is the acute situation, where we don't have the stable patient. We may have someone that's unstable, and we're dealing with certain symptoms, such as sudden CO2 drops, desaturation, cyanosis, hypotension that's aggressive. And so what do we do in this situation? Regardless of whether or not it's an air embolus, an amniotic fluid embolus, or a pulmonary embolus, you can just turn to managing the case. If they are intubated, which uh, in our center they wouldn't be. Um, I know in Bob's, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but um, watch what you do with the vaporizer. Turn it off. It doesn't have to be on. But also just manage the symptoms and really try to work with the vasopressor management, giving volume, but also expanding the space, giving inotropes if necessary to maintain forward flow. The other thing that we do in our center is if we have someone presenting with shock, symptoms perhaps of a PE, but maybe an error or other type of embolus, we do have our cardiac colleagues that are in-house and we're fortunate for that because they're able to be either a transthoracic echo for us or a transesophageal echo. And we're actually training our entire group of 14 obstetric anesthetists to do transthoracic echo because um, what I want our group to learn is just the rough and simple analysis so we can also look for other things like um, if someone's dropped a lung or if we need to place a central line or many other things that that device can, can help us with. But with echo, you look for the presence of right ventricular overload. If it's not there, then you search for other diagnostic clues of what this might be. If it is present, then you send the patient, if they stabilize, to CT angio. If it's not present, still manage the di differential diagnosis. But if it is present, then, and the patient is unstable, and or if the patient is unstable, then you just treat them for a pulmonary embolus, because it's probably something severe and something that you need to react to. Now, in terms of the transthoracic echo, the image and the window that we use is the apical four-chamber view, and that will give us some information about what's happening to the ventricles, but also what's happening to the atria. It'll also tell us if we have some trans, um, tricuspid regurg, and this comes courtesy of one of our cardiac anesthetists, and basically, what you're seeing here is a preserved apex so, uh, at the top of the crown there. And what preserves this motion is the left heart is beating normally. And so it's kind of pulling over the right heart. Right heart has expanded um, in, in the apex too much. But you're also seeing the second point of McConnell's sign, which is an expanded or dilated right ventricle. You can see how large that is. It's larger than the left ventricle. Um, and it also has some bowing of the septum towards the left ventricle, okay? And if you, we put a color flow Doppler on this, you would also see that there's tricuspid with regurg. You're seeing uh, flow from the right ventricle to the right atria. Um, and those are three signs that are helpful in telling you that there's some blockage to the right ventricle output, and oftentimes that blockage is gonna be a pulmonary embolus, okay? Especially if massive. If it is a pulmonary embolus, we do have therapeutic options, anticoagulation, adding a thrombolytic agent, doing a surgical embolectomy if it's something large, and then um, doing a, a venous filter if, if necessary. And finally, I'll just end up with some of the defenses um, for the future. And 
if this is diagnosed during the course of pregnancy, certainly individuals are put most likely on low molecular weight heparin, and we just need to be sensitive to the pharmacology of these agents when we think about when we're going to introduce our naraxal block. ASRA has given us some very good guidelines in terms of when to stop these agents, when we need to restart them before and after our naraxial techniques, and I advise you to, to look at those to, for guidance, and there's really good information there. So what have we talked about today? First of all, in terms of just basic facts, we know that the symptoms and signs are very nonspecific. They don't exactly point to the fact that this patient is having a pulmonary embolus. But when we look at this constellation of the signs and symptoms, when we pair it with the EKG that we have, when we look at the instigators and whether or not they're present or not, um, and we match these together, then we can have at least a diagnostic suspicion that we might be dealing with pulmonary embolus. The great advantage is that if we're dealing with hypotension and changes in saturation, that our immediate response should be the same, whether or not it's an air, amniotic, or pulmonary embolus. So that's the great uh, sort of response that we have. If the patient stabilizes, and when they stabilize, because I know you guys are great at resuscitating, um, then you can go down the diagnostic pathway of, of looking for the pulmonary embolus and then treating it in that way. We have to think about the responses that we provide, but also um, this whole idea of pulmonary embolism, the effects that it has, and hopefully with that hawkish approach, we'll be able to diagnose this well and treat the patients that have it. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm open for any questions. Thank you.